we're going to look at today. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We will begin in verse 14. If we've reached the final church in our study through uh, the, the seven churches of the book of Revelation. And can I just say, our Lord, he sure goes out with a bang with this one. If the church we looked at last week, the church in Philadelphia was the one we should all aspire to be like. Well, the, the church in Laodicea, what we see today, is one we should definitely not aspire to be like but truly seek to be the polar opposite of. Because it's to this church, Jesus has the most shocking and intense words of all the churches. So we should definitely strive not to be like them. But we can learn from them. And I believe the Lord can use what he says here for us to see if if there needs to be some real and serious changes made in our lives like this church needed to make. So let's get into, read with me verses 14 through 22 of Revelation, and we will see what the Lord has for us. Jesus says in verse 14, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him. And dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, we thank you so much for today. I just pray that we will be centered on you, and I believe that you've already worked in our hearts, Lord, as we've been singing praises to your name. Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you have a word for us, that your Spirit would truly speak to us, and that we would just open our hearts to you. And allow you to rule and reign completely in us, Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we read through this letter to the church of Laodicea, the most obvious observation is probably Jesus' harsh words, which might take us a little back and make us go, what did he just say? I mean, direct quote from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to this church, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. We are told Jesus comes to rebuke and chastise them. And he also says when he sees how they're conducting themselves, he wants to vomit them out of his mouth. Yum, right? Many of us might be like, what happened to the feel good? Like, I want to cuddle with Jesus. Those words are always soft. Well, Jesus, no doubt, wants to bring us words of encouragement. He wants to fill us with his peace and rest, but he also wants us to take our Christian walk seriously, to follow where he leads, and that means we need to keep him front and center in our lives which this church at Laodicea did not do. This church went off track big time. Spiritually, this church not only started to skid offline a little bit, this church pretty much flew off a 100-foot cliff, hit rock bottom, and is burning in flames down below. It was that bad. Spiritually, of course. And in order to revive them again, Jesus needed to take severe action. But notice something. In verse 19, he doesn't come to them with this scathing criticism because he hates them and wants nothing to do with them ever again. Jesus does not come and say, off with you, church, forever. I'm wiping my hands clean of you. No more. No, Jesus comes to them because he loves them, it says. Jesus cherishes the people here in Laodicea and is drawing them back to himself. And he says, I have a way of restoration for you. I have an answer to get you back on course. And not only that, at the end, there is one of the most tender and intimate promises of all the churches given to this church when they do return. You know, it's easy to focus on the brutal correction, but the heart of the Lord in this passage is amazing. His commitment to us, his people, is astonishing, especially because we don't deserve it. And it's my prayer today that that you can see his heart and you can understand how much he loves you and he desires that, that close, intimate fellowship and communion with you constantly. And whether you have not ever fully given your life to him, or you have drifted away, or you are one who is at the pit right there in flames, 
whatever it may be for you, whatever the case, I pray you would know that he has made a way for you to come back no matter what. If that's you, may you hear what the Spirit is saying today. And, and, and what he is saying is come to Jesus. Come to him. Let him rule and reign in your heart completely, knowing in him and him alone true satisfaction is found. Amen? But as we begin our study, we can see this church stop looking and depending on Jesus entirely. In fact, the name Laodicea means ruled by the people, which defines the spiritual condition of this church perfectly. They were no longer ruled by Christ. They were no longer seeking his will or pursuing him in their lives. Instead, they allowed the society they lived in to negatively influence them. And with this culture, it was all about the moolah. It was all about money. It's all about wealth and prosperity. And luxurious living was their focus. Laodicea became a dominant banking and financial city that found enormous fame and success in two main industries. The first was the manufacturing of wool. But it was not this, the common white wool like we think of when we, look at, when we think of sheep. No, no, no. This, in this region, there was an abundance of naturally stunning black wooled sheep with the most unique and shiny textured wool. So clothing and apparel made from this wool became in high demand, making Laodicean fashion the most cutting edge by far. Laodicea was the Beverly Hills of ancient Asia Minor. You know what's so cool is they even had a street named Rodeo Drive. They didn't really have a street name. But everyone coveted the latest trends there that were being produced in that city. It, and in other words, cha-ching. <laughs> it was a wealthy city. The manufacturing and selling of this black wool greatly contributed to the wealth in that city. But there was another industry that was possibly even more prosperous, and that was the healthcare industry. And I was shocked to hear that money is made in this field. I, it's so surprising to me. But it is, I guess. And Laodicea, it had a school of medicine, but what made their economy boom was the groundbreaking creation of an eye salve that supposedly cured many eye problems. And people would come from all over to purchase this miracle product. So having a monopoly, monopoly on a much desired medical product means money did not cease to come rolling into the city. So cha-ching, part two. And Le Laodicea was flourishing so abundantly in wealth and prosperity, the people of the city believed they were completely self-sufficient and could do everything independently of any outside sources. One historian recorded that even after an enormous earthquake destroyed the area, including much of Laodicea, the Romans came in to offer financial assistance to rebuild the city. But the Laodiceans refused the help. In their pride, they said, we got this. We can do it all on our own. We didn't ask for your help, nor do we want your help. This was their self-reliant mentality. Unfortunately, the Christians bought into this way of thinking as well. And we catch that, that when Jesus quotes them in verse 17, when he says, you say, I am rich, wealthy, and have need of nothing. See, these Christians, they thought they had everything, but they were wrong. This church was spiritually weak. So Jesus, he comes to them and reveals that their greatest need was returning to their dependence on him, to trust him and seek seek him with their lives once again. And I must admit, this trips me out a little bit when I think of this church because the most intense correction letter of all the seven churches was not regarding sexual immorality that was running rampant in the church or physically bowing down to idols like we see in other churches. But the issue was one of complacency, one of indifference and a lack of passion for the things of the Lord. And that makes me go, whoa. But it also makes me go, whoa, because I need to examine myself, and, and I have, and, and, and ask, Lord, where am I with you? Where have I placed you? Are you at the center of my heart and my life? Are you somewhere on the outside, knocking to come back in? You know, for this church, it was obviously wealth and prosperity that pulled them away from Jesus, but anything we emphasize over Jesus or place before him can send us on a downward spiral of spiritual decay, and it will. And this is why Jesus needs to be the priority always for our individual lives because if something else, if anything else takes the place of Jesus in our hearts, then we will become just like this church. And this is why Jesus opens this letter to them, reminding them and us how great he is. And in verse 14, he says, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. 
If this description doesn't say, I am to be the priority, and number one in your life, I don't know what else will. I mean, here Jesus is calling them to see his authority and importance over the church. And this church needed to see him for who he really is. And he begins by saying he is the amen. And oh, I love that word. You guys, you guys know I love that word. I say it all the time. But I think I love that word even more when you say it. When we speak a truth about God and I say amen and I hear you say it back. Amen. Can we just practice that again today? <laughs> Jesus is awesome, amen? amen? Jesus is powerful, amen? amen? How about this one? Jesus is coming back, amen? Amen. amen. Doesn't that feel good? I love it. But it's important to know that amen is not only the exciting response or even the routine ending of a prayer, you know, like when you're eating. You say, thank you, Lord, for this food. Bless it to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not just a period. It means a lot more than that. Amen actually means so be it, or most certainly, even the truth. So when you respond, amen, you're saying, ain't that the truth? I like that. <laughs> Jesus, is, Jesus is awesome. Ain't that the truth? It might be a little easier to say amen, but that's what it means. But think about what Jesus means by calling himself the amen. He is saying he is the absolute truth, that he is the God of truth. Amen to that, right? I mean, in a world that surely spouts off a lot of untruths and is in a continuous state of uncertainty, how refreshing is it to know that we belong to the one who is certain? He is so full of truth, he, it's because he is the truth. He is the amen. But he adds to that and he says he is a faithful and true witness, which means Jesus is completely reliable. Or to use the cliche, there is no fake news with Jesus ever. What he gives to us is always right. It's always accurate all the time. But this title also speaks of Jesus being consistent. He's never wavering and he will never let us down. Think about that. He will never let you down. Everyone will let us down, but Jesus will never let us down. You know, the theological term of, of one of his attributes is it's called uh, immutability. And immutability means that he does not change. That our Lord will never change. And that's so important for us to know because right now it seems like everything around us is changing, doesn't it? I mean, our country is changing. Our culture is changing. Our personal circumstances are changing. We as people are changing. You know, I see pictures of my kid, my kids from not too long ago and then I look over at them again. See the picture, look at them, and my heart shatters. I'm like, what happened? You're growing up. I actually say to them, I yell at them. I say, stop growing. But for some reason, they don't listen to me. They keep growing. And my son, he said to me, he said, I'm trying, Dad, but I just keep getting bigger. <laughs> I'm like, that's okay, that's okay. You know, a Greek philosopher is quoted by saying, change is the only constant in life. And we're seeing that, right? So many things are changing. Everything seems to be cha changing, but there's one thing, or I should say one person, who does not change, and that's Jesus. I mean, how good is that to know? That Jesus does not change. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm so glad that that is written in the Bible, that, that we have that truth, that he does not change. That, that, that brings such security to me, that Jesus Christ never changes. He always remains constant. He always remains the same. That no matter how much this, this society declines in morality, all the problems that we have to walk in, all the ugliness that we see around us, one thing remains that Jesus stays the same. He is constant. Everything he does is true and right. And we can praise him because his plan and all his promises that are found in his word, they remain unchanged as well. Amen? You guys are getting good at it. I like it. And then he adds, he is the beginning of the creation of God. You know, this description in no way means that Jesus was created by God the Father. Beginning can be translated source, origin, even ruler. One translation reads, Jesus is the ruler of God's creation. I like that. You know, with this title, Jesus is showing his complete authority over everything by saying this. I'm reminded of Colossians 1 where we are told this starting in verse 16. It says, for by him, Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him all things consist. This is how powerful Jesus is. This is how great he is. He created everything, the things that we physically see in this world and those things that we don't even see in the spiritual realm. Jesus created it all. 
And then that passage also tells us that in him they consist, which, which means he holds it all together. He sustains it all. This is our Lord. But notice that one essential statement. All things were created through him and for him. And that includes you and me. We were created to live our lives to honor him, to glorify him. It's so interesting, right after the sentence in Colossians, after the last sentence we looked at, listen to what we're told. It says, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. We are his people. We are to be his people. But so is his church. We are to be his church. And Jesus is overall. The church belongs to him. He established it. He is the head of it. And because of this, he is to be placed number one in church and number one in our personal lives. And yet this church allowed him to be placed on the sidelines. So after he reminds them of his rightful place of power and authority, he brings the correction, the spiritual diagnosis, and he says this in verse 15. He says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Can you just picture this moment when this is read in church? Hey, the pastor gets up there. I got a word for you today. This is right from the Lord. I just picture all the color from their faces just going out. Their eyes opening wide, their jaws dropping to the floor, and them going, what did he just say? I mean, this is the harshest thing said to any of the churches that we covered. You know, as all the letters were circulated among the seven churches, maybe the Laodiceans got word of all that was said before. I mean, this is the last church. Maybe they heard all the things that were said, and they were like, yeah, you know, Jesus had some tough things to say about Pergamos and and Thyatira and Sardis, but look at what he said about that insignificant church in Philadelphia. Look at all the good things he said. Surely he saved the best for last. Well, he definitely saved something for last, and it was not good. As Jesus does not have one favorable thing to say to them at all there's no i see all the good you're doing like like he does with most of the churches no to to the laodiceans he goes straight to the bad and when jesus looks at how this church is operating he is totally disgusted he even uses the word vomit you know this seems to be the only time in the entire new testament that this word is used and so you knowing me knowing me i did my intense research on what this word means in the greek and it's very deep This word vomit means just what you think it means. But to better better illustrate, you can think of it this way. Throw up, hurl, barf, (laughs) puke, (laughs) release a technicolor yawn maybe. You're like, Justin, you're so disgusting. My wife was begging me to stop. But you gotta have grace on me because I have boys and this is fun talk for us. But even more than that, this is what Jesus says about the church. You know, he paints this picture that it's extreme. And it's not just like when you take a sip of coffee that it's cooled to room, room temperature and you're just ready to, to blow it out of your mouth. Just go, <laughs> not like that. This is much worse. This is so unsettling. It's like a stomach bug. You've had that before. When you have that stomach bug that's just going to town on your stomach, you can't hold it back. This is what Jesus is saying right here. He says their lukewarmness has led him to this place of utter nausea. And when Jesus says... He uses that term lukewarm. This church would know exactly what he meant. See, with all their wealth, all their excelling industries, all their success, there was one problem that this city had, and their problem was their water supply. There was no good water sources around. So what they did was they, they, they built pipelines from two nearby cities, one from Colossae and the other one from Hierapolis. And the water in those cities, if I could say it right, my Spanish friends will c- correct me, muy excelente it was that water. Hierapolis was known for having hot springs, which were often used by the people for steaming hot, soothing baths. Just think of an ancient jacuzzi. I could just imagine later, so you go, oh, we're going to get that water. It's going to be so good. Well, on the other side was a Colossae, and just as satisfying but completely opposite was the water that came from them. Stationed at the base of huge mountains, it was the perfect place to receive melted snow streams which made the water from Colossae ice cold and refreshing. And so the Laodiceans must have been ecstatic, going, hey, these pipes, when they come into our city, we are going to get warm water from Hierapolis, and we're going to get the the most refreshing water from Colossae. But there was a problem. By the time both of these water sources reached Laodicea, they were no longer muy excelente. They were muy malo, maybe? 
The hot spring water from Hierapolis cooled, and the cold icy water from Colossae warmed. So both of these, these waters, when they hit Laodicea, became lukewarm. And that was very unpleasant. It was unpleasing and des- desirable. You know, sometimes even this water would be sus- susceptible to the growth of life-threatening bacteria. And Jesus used this. He used what was actually taking place in the city to say to this church, you know your water? That's you. That water, that, that just like your water is unpleasant in your city, you have become spiritually unpleasant to me. You know, lukewarm, it speaks of apathy. It speaks of indifference. Just going through life without realizing one's need to, to stay focused as, on Jesus as Lord. And Jesus is like, this apathetic, this half-hearted Christian living is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Because I came to change all that. I stepped down from eternity. Took on the form of man. I lived every single day of my life in complete perfection. I went to the cross and suffered for your sins to change your life. I've come to give you a new purpose, a new heart, new desires that are so much different than the old, stale life that you used to live. I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, where you're walking with me, where you're depending upon me, where you're looking to me, and you're impacting this lost world for me. Jesus looks at this church and he says, what you're doing is making me sick. It's making me sick. He sees all the passion. He sees all the priority they once had for him, gone. The flame is burned out. The, that desire to live the satisf- satisfying life in him has vanished. He even says he'd rather them be cold than hot. I mean, obviously our Lord wants us to be hot for him. And that's that place where we are passionate, where we're on fire. Completely committed, like seeking him. Every part of our life. But he says to them, he says, I'd rather you be cold than lukewarm. That's shocking to hear, cold than lukewarm. But he says that because there's a remedy for coldness. If you're experiencing this coldness and this, and this, this shivering spiritually that you're not right, you're going to know it. And you're going you're gonna to know that you need to be warmed up, that you're going to need to go to Jesus again. But this stagnant place of lukewarmness, of compromise, is deceptive. And the longer you stay there, the further you will drift away from the Lord. You know, this church, it thought it was well because life was going well. Because things were smooth. But Jesus, he looks in and he says, yeah, you know, things might be looking good on the outside. Outwardly, but inside, it's ugly. It's, 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 it's ugly. It's horrible. You're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind. You're naked. You know, so interesting. This, this church in Laodicea was bragging about their status and riches. Yet Jesus calls them poor. While the church in Smyrna, the persecuted church that we looked at, was, was going through it, that church was seen as poor, and yet Jesus referred to them as what? As rich. What was the difference? Was it really the, dis- the discrepancy of the amount of money in their bank accounts? I don't think so. I believe it's where their eyes were set and where their heart was. The difference was Colossians 3, 1 through 4, which says this. Paul writes, he says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. The difference was the church in Smyrna got this. And the church in Laodicea did not. It's absolutely fascinating to me. Did you know, at one point, the church of Laodicea would have read these exact words from Colossians chapter 3. You don't believe me? Read Colossians 4, 16. You should be a Berean and read that. (laughs) There at the end of the book of Colossians, Paul says to the church at Colossae, the city with the cold water, he says, after you have read this letter, he says, pass it on to the church at Laodicea so they can read it too. This church of Laodicea, a few decades before Jesus says these corrective words, would have exactly the answer of how they were to live their lives. The number one priority in life, the number one for them and us today is to set their hearts and their minds on Jesus. They had this. They even did this. But within a number of years, it all changed. And their eyes went from this to this, to looking all around them being focused on that, on this, the here and the now and everything that was taking place. And we have to ask ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, where's your heart today? Where's your heart? Where's your eyes? I truly believe 
now more than ever, it's imperative that we as believers are gazing at our Lord in heaven. We need to have his heart with everything that's going on. Because if not, we're going to be spiraling down, down, down spiritually. We'll find ourselves depressed. We'll find ourselves consumed. We'll kind of find ourselves bitter, frustrated as we walk in this world. And believe me, I'm there too. I, I was looking, I was like, Lord, please show me where I could be angry at everything going on right now. Please show me some verses where I could just be bitter and enraged all the time. I couldn't find any. But if we are, if we're in that place, then, then we're not consumed with the things of the Lord. We're fully consumed with the things that we're going through here and now. And I get it, and it's tough. But when Jesus is ruling your heart and your life, even in the midst of that, you will experience this rich walk with him, this abundant life in him. You know, I, and I always, I always talk about this. I think L.A., we, we have it one of the worst during all this stuff, you know. I, one of my pastor friends came in from, from Alabama uh, the other day, and we, we had lunch, and I'm like, you have it so easy in Alabama. I'm like, you have it easy in Orange County. You know, it's like when you come to L.A., it's like, what's going on in L.A.? But I do think there's something really good for us Christians who live in L.A. I mean, I, I love L.A. I'm, the Randy Newman song is playing in my head like 24 hours a day. I love L.A. I love it, you know. But I believe the Lord wants to teach us Christians who are here something. And, and I, I really think he's using it to purify us. He's really showing us where we're at. Because if we have to deal with what we have to deal with and we can stay focused on him, centered on him, empowered by him, we're in a good place. But if everything is pulling us down, if everything is, is tearing at us, if everything is letting us down, we're depressed and we're, we're just frustrated at this world, I think it shows where we're at spiritually. Because that's not what he wants for us. He wants us to, to experience that abundant life even now, yes, now. There's something amazing. When you look at churches like Smyrna, you look at churches like in Afghanistan, you look at churches in China, and you see all the persecution that they go through, and yet they are so focused on the Lord. They're like, they're going for it. They, they have this, this purity to their faith. And I think the Lord wants to teach us that. I think he wants us to, to grab hold of him, and no matter what comes, he wants us to experience him in a deeper way. And if we are not, if we are frustrated, if we are angry, if we are upset all the time, sure, there's a righteous indignation, yes. But we're not to walk in that. If, there's, if, if, if that's happening all the time, then it tells me, it tells me as I deal with that, that I am not trusting him completely. That something has gotten in the way of Jesus in my life. And I think he's teaching us something new. Because he wants us to be experiencing that. We, you know, and, and I think we need that for the church. We need that for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because if we're feeling it, they're feeling it. And how many people are heavy? And if you're in this totally depleted state spiritually, how are you going to minister and use the gifts that God has given you to minister to the body, which is what we're called to do? With the gifts he's given us, we are called to glorify him and build up our brothers and sisters. Encourage, edify the body of Christ. And yet if we are pulled down, if we are distracted, if we are are just, uh, just engaged with this, this, this frustration all the time. How are we going to minister? We're not going to see. We're going to be blinded to their needs. What about the world? I mean, seriously, if the world looks in and they see us on everything we post on social media, it's like, eh, you know, that's what it sounds like. Eh. Are they going to want that? Are they going to, oh man, I'm so drawn to you. What you have, I want. No, they're not going to want that. They're going to be like, no, I'm going to go somewhere else. We have such an opportunity we have such an opportunity to, to shine brightly. We have such an opportunity for God to just use us to impact this world. And even if we're walking in this depleted state, I know there's challenges. I know that. But if Christ is centered, then, then our response will be different. It will look much different than, than so much of what we see. This world needs it. I mean, 1 Peter 3, it talks about, he says something that, that it just goes right along with this. He says, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord, which means put him first. And then he says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. That you have. Are you ready? Are you on? Are, are, are you not? Are you depleted? I think we have such an opportunity to impact this world. But it starts with us. It starts with us. You know, we talk about it. Do a revival. Awaken LA. Awaken California. Awaken this nation. But man, if we are dead, if we are spiritually depleted, he's not. It starts with the church. It starts with the correction of the church. And that's why we see what we see here. 
And he says in verse 18, he says, I counsel you, I advise you, I exhort you. He doesn't end the relationship. You see that? He's pulling them in. And now he will show that the spiritual things he offers are greater than the physical things they are depending on. And in verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. And the richest, that, the wealth that he offers is the spiritual riches that are found in Christ. You know, I, I can't help but think of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where the Apostle Paul, he says this, he, sa- or he says when, or he talks about all the spiritual blessings are found in Christ in the heavenly places that we have. We have these spiritual blessings. And what he does after he says that is he expresses for about 10 verses what those spiritual blessings are. It's, it's, it's seriously like he, he doesn't even use a period there. It's like he takes one big breath and he just goes after it. He goes, let me tell you about how rich you are in Christ. And he says things like, you were chosen before the foundation of the world. He says you've been adopted, you've been accepted into the family of God. He says you've been redeemed, you've been forgiven. We just sang that. He said you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guaranteed of our inheritance, which means you're promised heaven. That all these things will hit you. You know, you might not have that Ferrari, that red one that you want so badly here on this earth. But he'll give you some, some, something so much better, even here on this earth. And that's those spiritual blessings that can only be found in him. He promises heaven. I mean, you talk about riches that money can't buy. That's what he offers. He says, and, and not black wool from a sheep, but he's going to give white garments. White garments, not, black garments, not from a sheep, white garments from the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, as John the Baptist said. And that's what it means. It, we, something has changed. In Christ, we are changed. That you may be clothed, he says, the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Clothed in these white garments, it speaks of the purity. It speaks, speaks of the righteousness in Christ, that, that, that undeserved righteousness that is imputed to us, that is given to us who believe in him. And yes, part of that is now. Part of that is as, as we become new creations in Christ, God, the Holy Spirit starts working those things out of our lives. But it'll be fully realized in eternity. In eternity, I mean, we, we're covering that. We've covered it already. We've covered it further in Revelation that, that we're clothed in white. It's realized that we are actually righteous. Totally, we will be experiencing that. And those are some valuable threads that I want to be clothed in. And not a t- temporary fix to our eyes. Jesus will anoint your eyes with eye sa- salve that you may see. He'll give us spiritual sights, vision that we can see permanently. We'll have the vision to discern the will of the Lord in our lives if we put Jesus first and foremost. We, we will know where to go. He will lead us individually. He will lead us personally. But he will, we will also be able to discern how to walk in this current world we are in. How we need to hear that. How we need to see that. I mean, how many are running around confused? How many Christians are running around just as confused, just as overwhelmed as the world is right now? We need to have our, our eyes open. We need to have the spiritual eyes of Christ where he will guide us and help us to see how we need that. I don't know about you, but I'm going with what Jesus offers over what this world offers. Let's not let anything substitute or stand in the way. Let's come to the Lord and receive this. Because only the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God can give us this, amen? Jesus says, you come to me. You set your heart, you set your affection, you set your mind on me. This is what I have to offer you. This is what I have to offer you, this abundant life. Verse 19, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Some of us are like, I like the first part of that statement, but not so much the second. I mean, I want to experience the love of God. I don't know if I want to experience the discipline of God. But sometimes it's the discipline which is revealing his love for us because we've gone far off and he needs to bring us back in. You know, the Bible says that, that we are loved. The, the, his discipline shows his love for us. Hebrews fi, uh, 12, 5 and 6. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Just like we learn how to discipline our kids and we we try and grow in that. We try and choose the punishment that it's right for them. Punishment that fits the crime or that they need to hear. Our Lord knows exactly what, need, what we need. And sometimes it is that, that still small voice that just like we say with our, our kids, hey bud, you just have to say that. And they're like, oh yeah, I blew it. Sometimes that's what he needs to say to us and we get it. Other times, 
like with our kids, they need a little bit more than that. And that's what he gives right here. That's what we see here. We see a stern warning to this church, a, a great rebuke, but that's to get them back on track. And he goes on to say, therefore, be zealous and repent. I mean, zealous is definitely, that word there is a follow-up to the word hot in verse 16. And it means to burn with zeal, be earnest, or get excited. So Jesus is saying, get hot, stir it up again. Get excited for me, get passionate for the relationship that I have with you once again. He says, repent, which we covered a lot as we looked at, looked at the churches. They need to repent, which means to turn the opposite direction. And in this case, it means to set your eyes, turn from what you're looking at now to set your eyes back on Christ. To do that again, to put him as number one, to gaze upon him, depend upon him once again. And then he says it, verse 20. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. You know, to me, this is much more graphic and uncomfortable than the projecting vomit illustration. And that's because there's no way that Jesus should ever be on the outside of our church or of our hearts. And that's why we do what we do here at church. Oh, we want to be entertained. Oh, can you get this in? Can you do this? No. We're going to center on God's word. That's what we're going to do because this is what changes our lives. Jesus uses his word to change our lives. So us as Christians, we need to come in and we need to center on this. Center on his word. And focus on Jesus. But you know what? In our hearts as well, personally, we need to make him the center. Remember as we studied the, the church of Philadelphia. Do you remember what it said about them? Or about him regarding them? It says that he has the keys, right? He can unlock any door. He can open any door. He has the authority and the ability to do that. And yet, what do we read right here? That he will not force his way through the door of our heart. He will knock, but he's not going to force his way. He could flick that door open so easily, you know that? He could go, and that door will slam open, crack into pieces. But he doesn't. He says, you need to open it. And he gently knocks, and he calls us to be the ones to open. You know, this is for the church but more specifically is to the individual. Do you notice? It says, Jesus says, anyone. He points to the individual. He says, you need to do it. You need to be the one to do it. I have to ask, I mean, personally, where is Jesus right now with you? Where is he? Has he made his home in your heart? Where you are seeking him every day, where he is ruling and reigning or is he knocking, trying to get in again? Do you remember those days? Do you remember those days when you woke up and you go, what do you want to do today, Jesus? <laughs> and you looked, and you, wherever you led, you were like, saw it as an opportunity. But what happens? We mature. We grow. We deepen. <laughs> no, we push Jesus out. And we focus on other things. Jesus says, I'm right here. I'm right here. I want to make a home here. And when I make that home there, you will experience a richness that you cannot get from anything else. Those things that you're trying to satisfy yourself with, that's not going to do anything. It might have a temporary good feeling in your life, but it's just going to deplete and it's going to pull you away. He says, what you need is me. I'm knocking. I'm knocking. Can you hear my voice? Can you hear me? Where am I? to the individual. Remember, he, he's not talking to the lost here. He's talking to believers. Can this apply to the lost? Absolutely. Have people been saved through, this, through the sharing of this verse? Absolutely. Because it's true. They are out, or Jesus is outside of their heart. They need to come in. It's true. But here Jesus is talking to the church. He's saying, where have you gone? Where have you pushed me? I'm right here. I'm knocking. I'm knocking. I want in. But I want in because I want to make your life better. I want to feel you. I want to empower you to walk in this world. Yeah, it's dark. Yeah, it's brutal. Yeah, you face some crazy challenges, and I know that you do. Some things we look at, and we're like, oh, man, why is this going worse and worse and worse and worse? Well, that's what's told. But you know what? It doesn't mean that we have to get worse and worse and worse and worse. It means we can get brighter, 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 brighter. <laughs> and that only happens, it only happens if, if, if he has the place of authority in us. And if we've removed him, it's not going to happen. If, if we've removed him, we're going to be bitter. 
If we removed him, we're going to be angry. If we removed him, we're going to lose our testimony. He's a faithful witness, but he's called us to do that as well. And the only way is, if he's in us, shining through us. He's knocking, and that's to anyone. Any one of us in Laodicea, any one of us at Calvary Chapel LEX today. Look at this, this is what he says. He says, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, this promise, tell me it doesn't get better than this. I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. You guys know me. I love to eat. But so does my Lord. Hallelujah, right? <laughs> Amen to that. But eating with someone in this culture doesn't only speak of filling one's tummy with food. It speaks of intimacy. It speaks of that communion. And, and you know it. I mean, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with a loved one, whether it's with a friend, when you're eating, there's, some, there's con- a connection going on. There's, there's something special that happens when you feast together, when you eat together, more than the food. In and out's good. But more than that is that, that, that connection that you have with one another. And I think this is why the Pharisees got so mad at Jesus when he at, ate with tax collectors and sinners because you come, become one with that person. You're so intimate with them. And, and the Pharisees looked at that and they couldn't stand it. These wretched sinners, look at them. He's eating with them. But you know what? Jesus isn't looking for perfection. He didn't with the tax collectors and sinners. And he's not looking that for that with us. You know what he's looking for? Intimacy. He's looking for that personal relationship where we put him first in our lives. And when we put him first, that means he's in control. He will take care of the cleaning up. We, when we're putting him first, we will do what he's calling us to do in the, the purity aspect, the holiness, practical holiness aspect. He will do that work, but, but he wants to be center. And he wants this communion with us. He wants this intimate relationship with us continually. The question is, is that what you want? That's the question. Is, it, it, where is your relationship with him right now? Is it intimate? It can be. It's what he wants, but is that what you want? He wants all of you. He wants to commune with you. He wants to walk with you and lead your life every single day. And we know it. We know it. That he will give us that abundant life that which means overflowing. That it's filled to the top, but it keeps on going. Will life become perfect? No, it won't. But he will enable you to walk through whatever you have to bear because he will bear it for you. But we gotta open it up, open up to him. We've got to allow him to rule and reign in our hearts. And then he will come in and he will dine with us. That speaks to the intimacy. And then in verse 21, it says, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You know, those who overcome the the lukewarm, half-hearted, complacent life, this is a wonderful promise. Obviously, we know we've seen it countlessly in Scripture, especially looking at these churches. We get to rule and reign with Christ. But I think this speaks of something even even. I don't want to say greater, but even intimate, more intimate, that that we will be in his presence forever. (laughs) That we will be able to just experience that peace, that that throne room. As we talked about, as we looked at chapter four of Revelation on Thursday nights, man, that there's this peace in his presence. And that's what he's offering us, that this world cannot offer. No matter what comes, no matter who we try and trust in this world, it ain't coming. It's only coming through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 22, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Where are you? Where are you? Where's your hope? Only the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, who will be with you every step of the way, can make your life full. If you don't know him, he's knocking. He wants to come in. If you do know him and you've placed all these things, these inferior things in front of him, he's knocking. He's knocking. Are you going to answer? That's the question. Are you going to answer? Because he's there. And, and if you're here, you're here for a reason. And I believe it's to get closer to Jesus. And whether you've been a Christian for 50 years, whether you've been a Christian for five minutes, whether you've been a Christian or you're not a Christian, it's time. It's time to open the door and let him in. Amen? Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for this day. I just pray, Lord, right now that we would receive what your spirit is saying to this church right now, to each one of our hearts. God, we need to be open to you. We need to place you as a priority. And I pray for myself. I pray for anyone in here who has allowed something, anything to come in the way. Maybe it is riches. 
Maybe it is relationship. Maybe it is a hope in this world to some degree that things would change politically or whatever it may be, Lord. We just ask right now that you would rule and reign in our hearts, that you would take over and that you would fill us, that you no longer be knocking at our, on our hearts, Lord, but you would come in. Come in and have your way. Come in, your, come in my heart, Lord, again. I just pray, Lord, for us to take our walk seriously with you, that we wouldn't play games anymore. We wouldn't allow distractions to overwhelm. But we would just be Jesus people that know you've called us, Lord. You're cleaning this up and you're sending us out to touch this world that needs you so badly because they're lost without you. And I pray that you'd do that. I pray that you'd use me, that you'd use my brothers and sisters here to reach those who are forever lost without you. You're good. You're faithful. The amen. Faithful and true witness. Beginning of the creation of God, the source of it all. Our hope is in you. Stop knocking and come in, Lord. We invite you in. I pray if, if anyone does not know him, that today that you would come to know him, that you'd make a decision to follow him. You have to make the decision. He's not going to force himself on you. But he's there knocking. Open your heart to him. Say, come in, Lord. Have your way. For those of us, Lord, if if anyone in here is backslidden, if anyone here knows that they're not right with you, if they've been being consumed with other things, that they would say the same thing. Come in. You're welcome. Have your way. I pray, Lord, even as we sing this last song to you, that we give you it all. It's Sunday, it's church, but it's life. We need, we need to take it serious. We need to put you first. I pray right now that you would speak to each one of our hearts. That you would lead and guide. That you'd touch us. Restore us. Be the priority. In Jesus' name, amen.